The Unshackled Waves, episode 148. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. It's budget week this week and apparently we are flush with cash again. The Turnbull government is predicting an early return to surplus in 2019-20 based on increased revenues. They are using the extra revenue to fund tax cuts, which what will be the final budget uh, before the election. They are also under pressure to increase the New Start unemployment benefit, which currently sits at $40 a day. Another issue over the past month that has popped up is live animal exports after 60 minutes aired footage of sheep in cramped conditions on board a ship to the Middle East. The Turnbull government has ordered a review and are not taking hasty action, unlike uh, what happened when the Gillard government suspended live animal exports. It was also the 200th birthday of Karl Marx, which was uh, concerning because many prominent people still celebrated it, and then it will at the beginning of this month, there was also May Day celebrations, the traditional communist uh, celebration day. To discuss it all, I am joined once again by The Unshackled's political editor, Michael Smythe. Michael, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Tim. Now, as I mentioned in my introduction, it's uh, budget week and uh, the Turnbull government and Treasurer Scott Morrison, they're, they're looking to deliver uh, a Santa Claus budget. Uh, after all, they're uh, planning to give uh, tax cuts, which we're uh, told for people earning less than $87,000 uh, will be around five to ten uh, dollars a week. It's, called, it's been called the, the stunner meal deal uh, tax cut. Uh, they're, they're prioritizing uh, low and middle income earners, obviously, to try and neutralize uh, labor, uh, saying that they're only looking after the, the high end of uh, uh, town. Now, uh, Turnbull government's been blessed because revenues have uh, increased. Uh, uh, Turnbull likes to tell us through jobs and growth. Uh, so it's allowed for uh, tax cuts and more infrastructure spending. So yeah, that, that does seem like the, the Santa Claus budget after all. Mm. It seems that way until you look at the figures of what they're actually cutting. The 5 to $10 a week tax cut, as good as it is, it's only a drop in the ocean compared to how much we actually have to spend. Well, people who earn less than $87,000 a year, it will only have a slight impact. It won't decrease the mortgage stress or the rent stress that low to lower middle income owners experience with, um, and for those who have children, those who are sending them to schools, even the public ones. So credit where credit's due, when they have, they have with, they have delayed the, um, the tax cuts for people on more than 87,000 a year. But as painful as it is for me to say this, I don't think we should be cutting taxes at all at this stage, simply because of the fact that our, our budget can't handle it. As for the, the touted infrastructure spending that has come in, all that is going to be introduced tomorrow night. Most of it is on a farcical parody of the Snowy Mountain scheme. Uh, Ron Pike, the uh, one of the um, we're getting a lot of, of nice spends down here in Victoria on trains and roads, but that's because we've got a state election coming up. Oh yeah, of course. And Dan Andrews has only done one good thing in the past four years. So, <laughs> and that was you know free TAFE to help people to upskill. That's the only good thing he's ever done for Victoria. Uh, the infrastructure spending, as I was saying, it was not, it's not going to be sufficient. Uh, there are no big ticket items apart from Snowy 2.0 as it's being touted, and it's not even going to work that well because the, well, there's, there's a lot more to it. I'll have to find the information for you Nick, for the next show, but Let's just say Snowy 2.0 is not what it's cracked up to be. 
I certainly agree with you that, yeah, we, we can't afford these tax cuts. I mean, we're yeah, flushed with, with cash now, but what about the, the next downturn? I mean, I would prioritise a return to surplus and uh, begin to pay down the, the debt, which is now over 600 billion. I just checked the uh, Australian debt clock uh, uh, before. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so I would, I, I'm definitely of the belief that you need to get the debt down first. And once we get you know, back into a decent surplus, then we can begin to uh, cut, uh, cut taxes and uh, do all that other stuff. Mm, that's right. And as fond as I am of Howard for giving Australia a lot of stability, both economically and socially, to a point, he did, he and Costello, his treasurer, they did somewhat squander the economic boom that we enjoyed as a result of selling off our gold reserves and, of course, the mining boom. They did squander some of that. They could have built a lot more infrastructure, but they didn't. And that was a travesty that should not be repeated. And it does seem that with Turnbull's 2.0, he is going to repeat the uh, policy virtue signaling, for lack of a better word. Oh, it's not just Howard and Costello that did this. During the, the Bush administration, they had their uh, policy of uh, deficits don't matter and uh, the, the debt increased. And once you set that uh, benchmark or that, that policy, then afterwards when a progressive government gets in they always uh, turbocharged it mm. well that's the thing yeah. there were some reports that came out of washington in 2000 in the early 2000s that bush actually wanted to cut the spending on the military but well then september 11 happened and it was deemed imprudent to cut the defence spending, so not only did they not cut it, they also increased it. Time of war, the war on terror, etc. And then the excursions into Afghanistan and Iraq, which Afghanistan was necessary, Iraq was not. And Iraq was a massive mistake that Bush 43 made. But that's another conversation for another time. Uh, it's not just nominally right-wing governments that have a habit of spending profligately. I mean, traditionally in Australia, Labor governments have done a lot more to uh, spend well beyond their means. And, you know, that's because you expect the Social Democrats in the Labor Party to be all about uh, spending money to make money, the Keynesian and neo-Keynesian uh, approaches to the budget. But the, it's important to note as well, Everyone does it. Both of the sides do the whole cooking of books and um, the, the both sides do the whole cooking the books and massaging the figures. I have uh, because we're yeah we're being told the budget will return to surplus in 2019-20, but. Uh, we both recall uh, Kevin Rudd and Wayne Swan telling us that the budget will return to uh, surplus in 2012-13. Uh, uh, Joe Hockey uh, set, said in opposition that they could bring the, the budget to surplus in their, in, the, in their first year. And Treasury has a history of getting these things wrong. I mean, uh, projections uh, into, the, into the future based on uh, the, the fiscal cycle, they're, they're always way out. Mm, that's true. And there are a lot of emergencies that they don't, uh, not just emergencies, a lot of emergencies and or contingencies that they don't make allowances for as well. That's another thing, Tim. Uh, you know, you've got Julie Bishop, our foreign minister, who is basically writing out checks every second day, it feels like, for stuff that it seems to be more for the benefit of people overseas rather than for people here. Don't get me wrong, I have nothing... I have no problems with foreign aid per se, but we've got to remember that charity begins at home, you know. Uh, and there's so much waste on uh, government programs like multicultural grants, uh, art grants. I mean, we fund some uh, woeful uh, uh, arts projects and uh, councils. I mean, if you cut substantial amount of that, you, you'd save so much money. 
That's true as well. Well, in the article I wrote uh, a couple of weeks ago for the Unshackled, um, talking about the part two of the, the um, <clears throat> pardon me. It was the second of two articles that I wrote regarding the 30th consecutive news poll that Malcolm Turnbull had lost. And I wrote, as you recall, I wrote 10 suggestions. The first one, which is the most important one, and would go a big way to helping sort out our economic strife, at least in terms of debit and credit and accounting, would be to rein in all the spending, especially the wasteful spending on welfare for non-citizens, which costs more than 12, I wrote $12 billion per year in the article, it's actually $16 billion a year. Why, the reason why I wrote $12 billion a year in the article is because 85% of that $16 billion figure was pay, what was payments to non-citizens with from countries that do not have reciprocal social security agreements with the Commonwealth of Australia. So I rounded it down to just over $12 billion because I worked out the figures and it's more than $12 billion. You get rid of that. Even if you get rid of that, that's a $12 billion saving that you could make and deficit was saying it's 16 billion it was expected to be 16 or 17 billion the year before that goes a big way to fixing that this year. I think actually, no, I beg your pun. I believe it was actually 33 billion at one that they were predicting as a deficit. I'd have to check that again. But if it's uh, even if it's thirty three billion, you take twelve billion. That's own, that's just over twenty billion, as opposed to more than thirty billion. So it, that would be a good saving to make. And that's just one thing. That doesn't even take into account all of the consultants that the Turnbull Coalition government has employed on a contractual basis ostensibly results-based remuneration, but it's a lot of money for a little bit of work and a little bit of consulting, which doesn't really serve the public interest, I don't think. Well, all will be revealed uh, t tomorrow night. Now, an issue that we haven't commented on yet, but it's been in the news for the, the past month, and that is uh, live animal exports uh, from mm. Australia to uh, the Middle East and other uh, developing nations. This was after this came to light again after a 60 Minutes episode, which uh, aired footage of sheep going to uh, the the Middle East in cramped uh, conditions. A lot of them uh, died from uh, exhaustion and uh, animals uh, suffering. It tugs at the 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 heartstrings of uh, a lot of uh, people. And uh, as Craig Emerson would say, not just you know inner city greeny tree hugging bleeding hearts. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, so the uh, the coalition in response has uh, are going to conduct a, a review of the, the live animal export industry. They're they're saying they're going to wait for the outcome of this review before uh, taking any action. They they say they won't have a knee jerk reaction like the the Gillard uh, government did when they put a blanket ban on live animal exports in response to uh, similar Four Corners uh, episode. Mm. But it seems to be that the, the focus this time, Labor, they've said they want to end live sheep exports. So they're just saying it's just the the, the sheep and uh, Susan Lay, the, the coalition uh, backbencher, well, pretty much because she's <laughs> got nothing else to do and wants to get her name into the, the news, has uh, got a private member's bill proposing to do the same. Well, Susan Lay used to be in the outer ministry, I believe. No, she was cabinet minister. Uh, she was cabinet minister. Yeah, health minister. Oh, that's right. She was too. I'd forgotten about that brief episode. And then she actually essentially got booted out by Turnbull. That's another story for another time. Yeah, because she bought a investment property on a official uh, a political trip. Oh, that was just the excuse. Turnbull had other reasons for getting rid of her. Um, I was actually going to mention the Four Corners segment that came out a few years ago, actually, in regards to live exports, and which was the trigger for Gillard to 
unilaterally and instantly suspend live exports. Bob Catter was furious about it, and he had a he absolutely tore the I forget which Labor minister it was at the time. Tore him a new one for uh, Joe Ludwig was the agriculture minister, I believe. Mm. Yeah, it was probably Ludwig that he tore a new one. Mm. The son um, of Bill Ludwig, the union heavyweight. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, I know Bill. Um, I have friends in the Labour Party, so pr- as much as I might surprise some of you. Um, point is, uh, trying to ban live exports, even live sheep exports, it's not going to stop the problem. And this is where it gets difficult, because uh, I was discussing this with a friend of mine today who actually doesn't really like live exports. On the one hand, our farmers and our economy we need the money. On the other hand, the conditions are just cruel and unusual. And uh, you know me, I'm, I'm not one of those people who will go crazy about animal rights, but at the same time, I hate animal cruelty. And I think that if we are exporting animals to be slaughtered either through, um, through halal mm. slaughter or any other um, religious-based slaughtering process or protocol, we need to be mindful that we don't want to cram all of our sheep, cattle, and our animals into um, unlivable conditions, at least let them enjoy the last few months of their life before they get slaughtered. I don't trust these, yeah, Middle Eastern nations like Qatar or the the UAE, which, yeah, they practice uh, halal slaughter, which is mm. uh, in- inhumane. I mean, there, there's no way we can ever trust them to, uh, to do the right thing. And yes, hy- hypothetically, uh, live animal exports uh, wouldn't happen, but uh, but it's... Uh, the, the argument always is is that these uh, nations, they don't have the, the refrigeration facilities to, if it was shipped over, just like already slaughtered, that uh, but, uh, it seems to be where bending over backwards to, to accommodate their demands, we're not, we're not putting much on, on them, uh, th- them at all. That's true. And it's crap to say they don't have refrigeration capacity. I mean... You look at the the Gulf nations particularly, they're amongst some of the richest nations in the world per capita. I'm pretty sure they can afford a couple of refrigerators at the docks somehow. I know that sounds facetious, so forgive me, but they can afford it. We are certainly bending over backwards, but that's the thing. We're chasing the unholy dollar, Tim. I mean, it's all about the money at the end of the day. Which is why, gov- which is why the Liberal Coalition government, to their credit, are not going to just knee-jerk react and say nope stop completely they're gonna wait and see which is well part of the course in politics because what uh, david little proud the agriculture minister and uh, matt canavan the resources minister have said that if you end this you're going to ruin uh, farmers livelihoods and of course in a uh, contest between humans and animals of course humans uh livelihoods are the are the priority here are much more important absolutely yeah, yeah. and of course we know that uh, our farmers for well, that they they struggle with a whole range of, of factors uh, drought uh, co- uh, uh, commodity and agricultural uh, pr- uh, prices so yeah uh, we, we don't want to uh, put them in a, another uh, difficult uh, uh, situation it's it's a real balancing act Mm, exactly there is one way we could possibly make it more ethic ethically pleasing for lack of a better phrase we could say that okay you want to import our stuff the money to facilitate i mean we're giving you all this lovely fresh meat the least you can do is meet us in the middle so to speak and you know give, provide help us get bigger ships so the animals aren't so cramped for example you know i mean they want the meat slaughtered in a particular way especially in the gulf countries they won't be so they won't be slaughtered in the halal way which is basically you just hold the animal and you just slit its throat and let all the blood drain out um 
But the thing is, they could meet us. They've, it's not like they haven't got the money to meet us in the middle. They yeah. could easily... They could easily do that. And, you know, I mean, like I said, I don't consider myself a champion of animal rights by any means, but if, they, if we are providing to the market, the market has to be receptive as well. I definitely agree that uh, we all agree that there should be some basic standard of uh, animal welfare. I mean, yes, uh, obviously, you know, we're not as far as the, as the vegans and say, you know, don't don't kill animals uh, at all. I mean, I, I I certainly believe that yeah, we need to you know consume meat to uh, to be healthy. Uh, mm. But yeah, there is uh, there is a humane way to. Uh, slaughter animals and uh, definitely in Australia we have uh, mastered that in our, in our abattoirs but it's, of course when we get into uh, this uh, uh, global uh, trade business of course other nations aren't going to be uh, the, the same as us and so and, and it's not really yeah uh, I, I agree with Craig Emerson it's not about uh, being a bleeding heart it, it's about making sure that other other nations we can well, try and get them to the same standard we are mm, that's right and it's important that we do this one of the this was a few years ago when the four corners segment was aired and there were there was actually a lot of blowback on the ground in the place where the um the guy admitted to mistreating the animals um actually crippled his village's economy but at the end of the day, if we could, you know, reduce the amount, you know, we put a premium, and this is, I guess, what's left of the libertarian in me talking, saying, you know, let's have, let's say there's less than we've got, so they pay more for it, the, and that way you can also use that either as a way to discourage the on mass cruelty or you can use the proceeds from that if they don't care to build bigger more comfortable ships for the animals so they're not you know trapped in a, a barely breathable cage so you can do it that way as well we'll go back to human welfare now well more specifically the the new start uh, allowance which is uh, the name for australia's unemployment uh, benefit. Now there's uh, pressure from uh, unions and social services group to raise New Start from, it's currently sitting at uh, $40 a day to uh, $50 a day in the, the next budget. The, the Greens, of course, they want it to be $75 a, a day. And uh, this uh, got, uh, was amplified in the, the news cycle because uh, Liberal uh, backbench uh, uh, Julia Banks, uh, member for Chisholm, she, she was asked on ABC Radio, could she live off $40 a day? And she said she could. And she's got about, I think, what, four or five properties, uh, her primary one's worth uh, f uh, quite, quite a few uh, millions. So obviously she <laughs> didn't come out of that uh, uh, looking good. Now, it's often argued that this $40 a day figure, if you're on um, welfare on Centrelink, you're entitled to a whole range of other subsidies and supplements such as uh, rent uh, assistance. And of course, no one ever starves on Newstart. I mean, it's always described, oh, how will people eat? Well, I don't recall anyone saying that uh, I'm hungry on welfare. The thing is as well, and Julia Banks looked really bad and really insensitive, if not outright stupid by making that comment. Sure, if, if you don't have to pay rent, or a mortgage, $40 a day is fine, $40 a day is plenty. The thing is though, the New Start allowance, as it is, $40 a day, you know, how many days are there in a week? There are some days in a week, so it's $280 a week. If you're paying, uh, let's say $200 a week in rent, wherever you are, if you're paying $200 a week in rent, that leaves you, what, $80 for the rest of the week? So. 80 divided by 7, 80 divided by 14, 16. So basically you've got, you've basically got uh, 
ten dollars a day that you live on after you've paid rent and that doesn't even take into account electricity bills phone bills gas bills if you have a gas stove or a gas hot water heater it doesn't take that into account and you know i mean obviously the new start is not supposed to be a handout it's supposed to be a hand up but at the same time with everyone living on well not everyone but i remember reading figures at one stage saying that, that a third of the country was living under rent stress out of mortgagees half of the mortgagees in australia were living under mortgage stress it's 40 dollars a day you'd have to basically and this is not even taking into account um Yes, I'll even take into account if you need medication. The actually, in fairness, it does have a, uh, a medication allowance if it's necessary. But um, they even have a telephone allowance. The point is, however, the rent assistance is only th roughly 30% of the actual rent that you're paying in the fortnight. So if you're paying, if you're paying $400 a fortnight, and you're sharing accommodation, you're only going to get about, oh, when I was on it, would have been $75 or thereabouts. If you live on, pardon me, if you live on your own, you get a little bit more. You get about $120 a fortnight for rent assistance. But if you're living on your own and you're still paying $200 a week, that's less than another ten dollars a day for the whole fortnight for you to live on so it's it, it's hard and the rules with Centrelink as well make it so that if you're living with a registered partner same sex heter or heterosexual de facto you actually lose some of your payment because they expect that partner to be supporting you as well so you actually lose money being in a relationship, being in a re registered or de facto relationship compared to being uh, a single person living with another single person. That's it's interesting. Just, mm. It's just, sorry, it's just not good. It's not, it's not enough to expect. Um, it's, not ex it's not enough to expect with all the high demand for real estate and the high costs of rent and or mortgages it's not it's not enough to support it it's just not going to work if, if rent and old mortgages weren't an issue that would be fine 40 dollars would be fine but we are nowhere near that uh, the the reason why awards argued that it's a low is to uh discourage uh, people from being on welfare that if you uh if you increase it then there's not uh, that much it's not it's not much more of an incentive to to find a uh, paid work but it's interesting that the business council they also uh, have stated they support an increase in new start uh, their argument is well if people are living on uh, forty dollars a day they've got to be able to get to all these job interviews and that so they need to be able to afford to to to, to leave their homes exactly until recently brisbane had the third most expensive public transport system in the world and to be to be fair and in to credit to the labor government and also to brisbane city council and the uh the local governments in southeast queensland we did actually have reduction in public transport costs for the for the for the um commuter but those costs are still there and that's yet another thing and as i pointed out before the phone bills yeah, whether you have a prepaid or whether you have a postpaid, it doesn't matter. You still have to pay those bills. And then if you have car as well, you've got to put fuel in the car. Petrol in Brisbane at the moment is somewhere between one forty and one fifty a litre. Yeah, we've heard and the same that's in just Melbourne. for the ninety one. Yeah, and and that's just for ninety one. It's on probably gonna increase a lot more soon unfortunately it probably won't be as high as a dollar 90 but probably could be looking at a dollar 60 or maybe even a dollar 74 regular unleaded in the next few months so you know, start saving 
Now, of course, the, the federal government, they uh, resist uh, increasing New Start because they, they still have this perception that it's uh, politically expedient to beat up on uh, doll bludgers. But, but I'm not so sure. There's, uh, these days, there's a lot more sympathy for uh, people who uh, are struggling because there, there's so many more people who feel that uh, they're struggling themselves. And a lot of people do receive uh, some form of uh, assistance uh, from the government and there's always I know that whenever we at the Unshackled post an article on uh, welfare it's uh, people always say well how, how about the, the the politicians why don't you know they give up some of their uh, benefits that was it was a similar reaction to when they introduced the drug testing uh, trial for uh, welfare recipients a lot of people were saying well <laughs> drug test the politicians why should they get to uh, 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 use drugs if they're telling the rest of us uh, not to. So yeah, it, it's it, it's not a, uh, a black and white issue like it used to be. Mm. Oh, it's definitely not. It's you know, the drug testing. Like in theory, I support that, but realistically speaking, it's actually more expensive yeah, yeah, exactly. to implement the drug testing and. Not everyone's, I mean, most, I mean, A, they can't afford it, and B, they're just not going to, um, they're not going to try it if they can't afford it. I mean, the, the almost prohibitively expensive increases on tobacco have convinced a lot of people to stop smoking. I don't That's forget there's so a crackdown on Chop Shop in the budget, the, uh, the, the butt squad. <laughs> I heard that, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, that's a horrible name, even though it's a joke name that you or whoever wrote the article brought up. But it's... <sighs> the thing is, you know, why is there all this need to regulate everything? I'm not even a libertarian, but I look at everything the government's doing to crap down. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. It's like, come on, give us a break. You know, I mean, I rather cynically said to my better half today while we were driving to a, to catch up with a couple of friends, road police and command, more like revenue command, am I right? That's what I said to her. She laughed, of course. But it's just... Often with the, these increases in regulation, you're right, they actually like cost more uh, to implement than what you could ever hope to uh, recoup. But it's the easiest way for government to uh, virtue signal and say, look, you know, we care about uh, this issue. I'm helping. <laughs> it's basically what it is. But it's just, it, it is virtue signaling. It's not doing anything productive at the end of the day. It's just alienating the people who are doing the right thing. Now, there was a, a birthday uh, this uh, past week. It was uh, Karl Marx's uh, 200th birthday. and Ah, uh, uh, yes, Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> and yeah, it was commemorated in, I saw, a lot of uh, the European uh, press. And there was uh, a poll that uh, said 49% of uh, British people think his socialist ideas uh, had a uh, positive contribution on the world. I saw that the socialist alternative here in Melbourne had a special uh, birthday party. And it's like, wow, how, how many uh, more uh, pe people do your ideas uh, have to kill <laughs> before people actually uh, see you for, for, for what you've done? I mean, over 100 million dead in the, the, the 20th century, terror, uh, famine, and yet this this guy is is still celebrated and you know despite that he said that he cared about you know the the working class he, he never set a uh, foot in a factory he was part of the the, the bourgeois mm, and he let his children die and i quote as a sacrifice to bourgeois capitalism unquote because he refused to get a job he was supported by his friend who is a wealthy industrialist frederick ingalls and it's and you think you look at it and you think you are a you you are such a horrid being i hope you are but i know you are burning in hell i don't hope you're burning in hell i know you're burning in hell the thing with marx is that everywhere you look at where people invoke marxist ideas people say oh but it's not real communism it's not real marxism marxism never been tried bullcrap pardon my language um <clears throat> that's nonsense it has been tried 
communism, socialism, they are all the logical conclusions of Marxist philosophy. Even the cultural Marxism, the problem with cultural Marxism, why it's still a logical conclusion of Marxism is in the results. What you have is an undermining and overwhelming and overthrowing of our society, all of our traditions, all of our values, to impose a new order, a new dictatorship, as it were. Under Lenin, it was the dictatorship of the proletariat, in which the revolution was always ongoing. There's never going to be a perfect communist utopia, because the revolution is always going. There's always going to be more traitors to purge. There was always going to be more death and destruction, more yet another enemy to overcome. Funny enough, the neoconservatives think like that as well, but that's another story. In regards to the the cultural Marxism of the Frankfurt School, they want to have a dictatorship of intelligentsia, although, as my uncle and I glibly refer to them as pseudo-intellectuals, because they're not really um, they're not really intelligent. And it's also at the fault of uh, conservatives as well that we haven't actually fought back. We've been anemic in our um, in our defense of our values and our traditions. So, and the fact that 49%, 49%, that's a massive number, that's almost half of Britons think that his socialist ideas have made positive contribution that is a testament to the success of the Frankfurt School and its acolytes undermining of our values and our traditions, our, our social virtues, really. Our civil, undermining of our civilization. What we're finding is that we have a lot more uh, disenfranchisement, both real and perceived by people, which is why people are embracing extremism on both sides. People are becoming either more progressive or more conservative. They're becoming either more globalist or more nationalistic. Uh, left and right are, are, are no longer a really valid way of determining where someone sits politically because in some some people would call me left, other people would call me right. And you, you'd have the same. I mean, being libertarian, you'd have some hardline conservatives calling you a lefty. Whereas no, not there so are much some... anymore. <laughs> yeah, so you're growing out of it. <laughs> Sorry, bad joke. But seriously, though, the thing is, um, the pendulum is swinging back, and it's starting to swing back at an accelerated pace. So instead of the globalism that dark forces and elites want us to endure or suffer depending on your point of view the pendulum swing back the other way towards nationalism and in some cases traditionalism but the extremism that comes with nationalism is ironically a part of identity politics which comes from again the frankfurt school so the frankfurt school wished to sow discord in western societies making it more vulnerable to a Marxist takeover whilst not realizing that the elites have now hijacked Marxism and now Marxism is a essentially a tool of the rich to undermine the people whom they claim to help. In France they had a, a big uh, May Day uh, celebration or uh, a riot, uh, uh, more like it, uh, while Emmanuel Macron was uh, in Australia and it was also the, the, the 50th uh, anniversary of their uh, infamous uh, 1968 uh, riots which nearly brought the, uh, the, the government down. So yeah, um, socialists and uh, <laughs> d uh, destruction, they, they pretty much showed who they were on May Day. Mm, that's true. They seem, to, they seem to like doing this a lot on the May Day holidays because in australia we don't celebrate may day on may the first we celebrate labor day on usually the first monday of the month of may personally i'd be in favor of returning it to literal may day literal first of may but that's because i'm a traditionalist at heart the thing is tim they do this every year they have their riots you know they have more grievances to yell about 
but it's not going to achieve anything and it's actually going to undermine the good work that trade unions can do when they're not being thuggish in terms of making unreasonable demands from the government. Well, the, the Berlin Wall came down in uh, 1989, the, uh, uh, just uh, a week before uh, I was born, and uh, certainly uh, people growing up in my generation never experienced the, the horrors of uh, communism or never saw it on display in, in, in other countries. And there seems to be this... Uh, well, the further away you get from something bad, the 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 more that you uh, forget what what it was like, and the, uh, of course people just see like young people see uh, North Korea is or oh, well, that's just a, a, dicta a dictatorship, uh, but yeah, the, uh, and because we have gotten so wealthy over the, the past uh, thirty years, there seems to also be this attitude. Well, what do we do now? I know we need to. Uh, uh, s uh, spread the wealth. I mean, if we we just do it right this time, they they don't know the the consequences, so they just think that society will be uh, as is. It's it's I, I, like they think, for example, that confiscating Gina Reinhardt's wealth would have absolutely no ramifications for the national economy. Even if I were to support that, which I obviously don't, because you know I don't believe in theft. I'm not a socialist. I would say, even if I did support it, the problem with taking away all of Reinhardt's wealth is the fact that she uses her wealth to expand her business interests, which ultimately will lead to the creation of more jobs. More jobs mean more income taxes being paid into the government, not to mention the mineral, the, the, uh, the taxation on revenue that you'd get as well you know all taxation on profit rather depending on which government is, is in power at the time so it'd be a bad idea to do that and the most important thing tim is that and you know this as well as i do is that <clears throat> pardon me the most important thing tim is that you can't change human nature there are always going to be some of us who are going to be more selfish than others you can't reduce us to automatons we're individuals we're human beings we're made in the image of god we have free will we are going to do, some of us are going to do good things some of us are going to do bad things we're not going to be cogs in a machine we cannot by our very human nature be just cogs in a machine it doesn't work uh, well we hope that uh marx's ideas they, they don't gain uh, any more uh, traction and they seem to currently do. But uh, thanks for joining me again uh, tonight, uh, Michael. And uh, apologies to you and the rest of our viewers and listeners for the technical uh, difficulties that we had uh, th throughout the show. It, it seemed like you were slurring your words, but no, it was just the, the connection wasn't good tonight. Mm. Thank you, Tim. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. There is another big event coming up in Melbourne soon, which I'd like to encourage all of you who are in the area to attend. That is the No Snowflakes Pub Night featuring Avi Yemeni and Sydney Watson. It is on Friday the 1st of June at 7pm and will be held in the South Yarra area. Tickets are free and can be booked via Eventbrite. Our friends at Liberty Works, their next upcoming event is a Jew, Muslim and Christian walk into a bar featuring Avi Yemeni, Imam Tawidi and Kiralee Smith with Professor James Allen as the Devil's Advocate. That is on Thursday the 17th of May at 7pm at the Mount Gravitz Bowls Club in Brisbane. Uh, Sydney and Melbourne events will be announced shortly. So tickets can be bought at libertyworks.org.au. Also, don't forget, if you want to take the Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards in the process, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the Unshackled. Also, don't forget, we have our online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right-thinking people. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.